This is Don Hollenbeck, CBS London, October 12, 1492. After three days of silence, we're going to try to reestablish shortwave contact with the missing Columbus expedition. For three days now, there has been not a single word from John Daly, our CBS correspondent, aboard the Columbus flagship Santa Maria in the Western Ocean. No one in Europe knows what has happened. By now, the Santa Maria and her two sister ships, the Nina and the Pinta, have either sighted land, turned back to Spain, or met an unknown fate in uncharted seas. When last heard from, the fleet was still afloat, but a crisis had arisen which eloquently revealed the difficulties which have beset the little flotilla. October 12th, 1492, London. You are there. Europe speculates. What has happened to the Columbus expedition? Triumph or disaster? CBS takes you back to the fears, the hopes, and the suspense of 1492. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now... CBS London and Don Hollenbeck. Contact with John Daly, who has a shortwave transmitter aboard the Santa Maria, from which he has been sending us regular broadcasts. Three days ago, at the crisis of the voyage, those broadcasts ceased. Perhaps the fleet has run into adverse atmospheric conditions. Perhaps John Daly has had trouble with his transmitter. Or perhaps, and this is of course entirely possible, the Columbus expedition is lost. Our circuits are open now. We'll try once more to make contact with John Daly out in the Western Ocean. Come in, John Daly. Go ahead, John Daly. This is CBS London calling the Columbus Expedition. CBS London calling the Columbus Expedition. Come in, John Daly. Come in, John Daly. Once more, we have failed to make contact. We'll try again in a few moments. From the character of the men on the expedition, there is good reason to believe that the three ships and the men aboard them will carry this voyage through successfully. To show you the type of men and the strength of the ships they sail, we take you now to Palos, Spain, for the personal testimony of people directly connected with the expedition. Go ahead, Ken Roberts, in Palos, Spain. Here in this little seaport town north of the city of Cadiz on the west coast of Spain, the Columbus expedition departed 70 days ago. Here the ships were outfitted. Here the 90 men aboard were recruited. Here, in a very real sense, is the heart and soul of the Columbus expedition. And here beside me now is the brother of the admiral, Bartolomeo Columbus. Senor Columbus, what do you think has happened in the three days of silence since we last heard from your brother's flagship? Uh... With my head, senor, I, I do not know more than you, but with my heart, I know my brother is safe and, and will accomplish his great mission. What makes you so sure, senor? Well, my brother has the best ships afloat. He has strong-hearted and tested mariners. And he is a skillful and experienced navigator. But above all, senor, my brother has a plan, a dream to reach the Indies by sailing west. Senor Bartolomeo, how long have you been associated with your brother and his great project? Uh, for 15 years, my brother tried to interest the kings of England, France, Portugal, and the Republic of Genoa. But they called him an impractical dreamer. Alone, the king and queen of Spain understood. Tell me, Senor Columbus, has your brother the admiral been a sailor all his life? Oh, yes. Our father was a poor weaver in Genoa. Uh, the sea first called my brother when he was a little boy. He sailed in the surface of Genoese merchants until his ship was sunk by pirates. Pirates? Where? Uh, it was off the southern coast of Portugal in 1476. And what happened to the admiral? Uh, my brother was wounded in the battle. Uh, in the water, he hung on to a piece of wood. And though he was bleeding and his strength was flowing from him, he swam to the shore. My, my brother had the great courage. He is not easily conquered. He has fought the sea before and beaten it. He is fighting it now, and he will win. Thank you, Senor Bartolomeo Columbus. 
The Admiral's brother has shown you the quality of the leader of the missing Columbus expedition. To tell us now about the qualities of the men who sail under him, I'm going to call on the wife of one of the mariners, Senora Ruiz. Senora Ruiz will speak in Spanish, which I will interpret, and I hope you will hear in her voice the confidence born of her faith in her husband. A faith which is typical of the families here whose men are aboard that fleet. Senora Ruiz, ¿cree usted que su marido regresará? Si es posible para un hombre el regresar, Sí lo creo. Él conoce el mar. Ha sido un marino toda su vida y su padre lo fue antes que él. I asked Señora Ruiz if she believed her husband was coming back. She said he knows the sea. He has been a sailor all his life, and if it is possible for a man to come back, he will. Pero señora, ¿y qué me dice usted de esos terrores misteriosos, los monstruos? Las cuevas, los remolinos. ¿Qué das el fin de la tierra? Nadie puede saber nada acerca de esas cosas. Si tales contrariedades se sucedieran, estoy segura de que estará en las manos de Dios. Pensarlo me da miedo. Me preocupo. No puedo conciliar el sueño de noche. Pero... Pero rezo. Y tengo fe. Gracias, señora. As for the terrors of the deep, sea monsters, whirlpools, other things that are said to exist out there on the ocean, she says for such things, he is in the hands of God. Senora Ruiz admits that she is afraid. She worries and cannot sleep nights, but she does pray, and she does have faith. Great faith. So does Father Juan Perret of St. George's Church here in Palos, the spiritual leader of this little seafaring community. Father Perret, you gave the Admiral a communion before he sailed, and you pronounced a benediction for the fleet, didn't you? Si. Sí. It was a cruel morning, gray before the dawn. The people stood on the dock and waved farewell. The women cried and held up their babies for their husbands. The seagulls went with the ship, and the church bell rang. See, <laughs> it was a cool morning when the admiral sailed in search of the setting sun. And you think, Padre, that... I have no fear, my son. They are safe. The admiral sails for God on a new crusade. God will protect him. Do you speak, Padre, of the Admiral's desire for a crusade to rescue the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem from the Muslim Turks? See, my son, that is why the Admiral has sailed to the Indies, to find the treasures there and use them in the holy war against the infidel. So, as I told your colleague, Juan Dali, just before he sailed with the expedition, they cannot fail. But, Padre, they have been out of touch for three days. Out of touch with men, perhaps. Not out of touch with God. Gracias, Padre. And now this is Ken Roberts returning you to CBS London. This is Don Holland Beck in London. Once more, we will try to make contact with our correspondent, John Daly, aboard the Columbus flagship Santa Maria. This is CBS London calling John Daly and the Columbus Expedition. Come in, John Daly. Come in, Santa Maria. The signal is not of broadcast quality. That sound of voices may be what the technicians call ghost voices. Weird patterns of static which sound like people talking. But on the other hand, it may be John Daly trying to get through, so we'll call him in again. This is CBS London calling John Daly with the Columbus Expedition. And once again, nothing. But we'll continue to try to make contact. It's possible the fleet has run into atmospheric or ocean conditions with which men have never had any experience because the Columbus expedition has been sailing in completely unexplored and uncharted waters.
strange things have already happened on the voyage. John Daly's shortwave description of events on the afternoon of September 21st is typical. We made a record of that broadcast here in our studios, and we play it for you now. This is John Daly on the bridge of the Santa Maria, 12 days out of the Canary Islands. For the past three days, the men aboard the fleet have lived in growing terror. We are in a sea of weeds. Nobody has ever seen anything like this before. That's the lookout at the mast calling out weeds to the horizon. And the man at the bow answers, bow still free. As far as the eye can see, in all directions, there stretches a great meadow of weeds of green and yellow. And it looks solid, solid enough to walk on at night. When your imagination is at work, you think you see strange shapes moving about. But the ocean hardly moves. The mat of weeds holds it down. You can put your hand in and lift up great masses of it. But there's no clear water underneath. The weeds close over the hole as fast as you make it. We first saw these weeds five days ago. On the 16th, the weeds were scattered then, appearing in strips and islands. But slowly they, they closed around us till they became the present solid mass. How long this will go on, I don't know. The men don't know, not even the admiral. And the admiral's pilot, Senor Peralonso Nino, beside me here, doesn't look very optimistic either. Senor Nino, is there any prospect that these uh, weeds will break up and give us clear water once again? No, senor. I very much fear that the weeds, they do not break up. They get thicker, thicker all the time. Well, what will happen, senor Nino, if the, the thickness of the weeds increases? We will be trapped here, stranded in this desolate waste. We will be frozen in. This is Don Hollenbeck again, a sea matted with weeds from which the ships finally emerged is just one of the unknown terrors the Columbus expedition may be up against at this very moment. On October 9th, John Daly reported another strange situation which changed suddenly, and here's the record of that shortwave broadcast which we made in our studios at the time of its transmission. This is John Daly a little after sunrise of October 9th, 1492. It's hot, baking hot. For three days we've been sitting motionless on this heated oven of an ocean, not moving. There's not a breath of wind. We're in a dead calm in the middle of nowhere, and we're worried about our water supply. Even the voice of that cabin boy that you can hear singing in the background sounds part. And by the way, he's chanting the traditional ditty with which he has turned the hourglass. Admiral Columbus insists that traditional ceremonies be kept up even though it's been 30 days since we last saw land. He feels that it helps morale, but the morale aboard this ship and the other two ships of the fleet can't hold out much longer. The men have only one thought now, to turn back, to go home, to write off this expedition as a failure. They're in an ugly mood. Four of the crew are condemned murderers who obtained pardons from the Spanish king by sailing with Admiral Columbus, and they are the ringleaders now, desperate men with nothing to lose. I don't think it's going too far to say that there's mutiny in their hearts. They might have seized this ship or these ships before this and forced the return except for just one thing. There's no wind, not even a breath of air. And the silence is so complete that the men are afraid of their own voices. Even the Pinzon brothers, the captains of the Nina and the Pinta, have petitioned the admiral to turn back, but he won't listen. He's stubbornly set on a dream to reach the Indies by going west, and it's, it's become an obsession, a fanaticism. However, it's no longer a question of the Indies now. It's men's lives. The crews aboard the ships of this fleet are liable to make serious trouble if the wind ever blows again. But that's the matter. Something has happened. And moving about. Only by hanging onto the rigging can I keep on my feet. Waves, but where have they come from? There are huge waves all slamming into a broadside, but there's no wind. And yet this ocean is in a turmoil. The men are all fighting at the water. Where's the wind? It will be here, senor, too. Somewhere 
Now there is a hurricane. We cannot see it, but it has sent those waves rolling back. And the wind will reach the stones last sea. Soon our sails will be filled with wind once more. To blow us home, Admiral. To blow us back to Spain. No, senor. To blow us more to the east. We sail on. Sail on. This is Don Hollenbeck in London again. That was the last word heard from the Columbus expedition. Since then, we've had no luck getting through. Our circuits have been open all through this broadcast, and now our technician tells us those ghost voices are back and that the signals are clearing up a bit, so let's listen. We're not sure yet. It may be nothing but those strange patterns of static coming in from the Western Ocean. Wait, wait. I thought I heard CBS... It is, it is. It's John Daly's voice. The Columbus expedition is found again. John Daly's gotten through. He's trying to establish contact with us. This is CBS London calling John Daly. CBS London calling John Daly. Come in, Daly. Go ahead, Daly. I hear you. I hear you, CBS. Can you get me clearly? Are you getting me clearly? Yes, yes, we hear you, John, and we're certainly glad to hear from you again. Go ahead, John Daly. Go ahead, Daly. I'm sure glad to hear you. You must have been wondering what happened to us. All Europe has been wondering, John. We were afraid you dropped off the earth. Oh, nothing as bad as that, John. As a matter of fact, I got news. Great news. That's why I've been trying medically to get through. I can only hope I'm coming through plainly. It must be those weird atmospheric conditions for Graham. Probably magnetic forces, because the needle of... What's the news, John? Have you found land? Uh, to something I've never been experienced before... But, but tell us the news, experience. John. What's what? the news? What's the news? Oh, well, look. Look, my great news is that uh, land is near. It must be near. We haven't seen it yet, but we've had so many uh, conclusive indications that we're pretty sure we're going to find it. Lots of migrating birds have been flying overhead. There have been floating boards pieces of carved wood, and finally, just about an hour ago, a branch was fished out of the water with the leaves still fresh, and a little flower clinging to it that resembles those uh, uh, dog roses on the hedges in Castile. Uh, any moment now, while I'm speaking, you may hear the cannon from any one of our three ships. That's the prearranged signal that uh, the one of them has sighted land. It's a beautiful night out here, or morning, I should say. You know, it's uh, 2 o'clock now, October 12th. The moon is half full, riding high up on our port quarter. Jupiter is rising. Saturn has just set. The stars, however, are dim in the reflection of the moon. It's very bright, but I can still make out the square of Pegasus and Casapia's chair. I can also see our other ship. The Cinder is out there in the lead, plunging and rolling and uh, throwing spray. Her sails with that great green cross of the Christian sovereigns of Spain on them, are bellying out into the wind. All of us, by the way, are carrying full sail, and that's probably kind of dangerous at night, where there's a chance that there may be hidden shoals, but nobody seems to care. The excitement is, is so intense. We just don't care about shoals. Our drive is on to the promised land, which lies somewhere out there ahead of us. Perhaps it will be some time yet before... The signal has come from the center. Land! Land! That was the signal for man. Land is out there ahead of us somewhere. I'm standing down on the deck. I can't see it. But the lookout up in the mast sees it. He's pointing forward. The men are crowding the rail, straining the sea. Oh, it's land, all right. Land, even though I still can't make it out. Somebody else has just seen it. And there's the moral. They are crowding out of the rail, pointing forward. And I can see it now, too. A white sand cliff gleaming on the horizon. And a, another one of those sand cliffs, and there's a dark line of land connecting them. Land! Land we found what we came after. Sandemonium has broken loose here on the decks of the Santa Maria. The strain the men have been under is snap. They're shouting and laughing and crying, slapping each other on the back. There's no limit to their joy. And I, I'm finding it kind of hard to talk myself. I'm all choked up. The only thing I can say is we made it. We made it. We've arrived at the Indies. I'll be back with you soon to describe the actual landing. And until then, I return you now to CBS in London. This is Don Hollenbeck in London, and this is the moment all Europe has been waiting for.
And now to explain the meaning of this momentous news we've just heard from John Daly, we have at a CBS microphone one of Europe's most famous geographers, the Florentine Amerigo Vespucci. We take you now to Barcelona and Amerigo Vespucci. I am Amerigo Vespucci. It is impossible to conceive the full significance of the news which we have just heard from the Santa Maria. The land which Admiral Cristoforo Colombo has reached is Chipango, or the legendary island of Japan. Behind it lies the kingdom of India and the territory of the Grand Khan of Katai, or China. Of these lands, the famous Venetian explorer Marco Polo has told us that they are rich beyond imagination. The people eat off golden plates. They walk on floors of gold. The children wear pearls and the women dress in satins and pearls. Admiral Colombo has shown the way. Shortly, many will follow. Many, many. I will be among them. Thank you, Amerigo Vespucci. And now to the Royal Palace here and Ned Kalma. This is Ned Kalma reporting to you from the throne room of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in Barcelona. The king is speaking to his subjects, celebrating Columbus's sighting of the Indies. Ferdinand is a man of about 40. I've never seen him so excited before. He's permitted himself to loosen his regal calm. He's smiling and he shakes a bit as he fumbles with the paper from which he's reading. The king has been announcing the honors and rewards which he will bestow on the admiral. Columbus will be governor and viceroy of the lands he has found with a tenth part of the riches therein, free of all taxes. And furthermore, he will be entitled to call himself Don Christopher Columbus, Grandee of Spain and Admiral of the Ocean Seas. Now, Queen Isabella is speaking, or as she's called here in Spain, Isabel. The queen is a charming, sympathetic woman, also about 40. Las joyas mismas de la corona hubiera empeñado para ayudarlo en su empresa. The Queen has said that she thanks the Lord that in his mercy he sent Don Christopher Columbus to the Spanish court. She has a thousandfold justified her faith in him, for she would have pledged her royal jewels if need be, she said, to send him on his voyage. The ceremonies here in the court continue, but CBS cuts away now to La Rabida and Arthur Hannes. This is Arthur Hannes in the monastery of La Rabida, a mile and a half from the little seaport town of Palos, where Admiral Columbus began his great voyage. With me at our CBS microphone is the Admiral's 12-year-old son, Diego. Young Diego has a prepared statement in Spanish, which he will read, and I will translate. Under, Diego, under. <coughs> dice, dice este mi libro, que el sabio Seneca dijo un día. In my school book, there is a speech of Seneca's that reads, Tiempo vendrá en que el mar océano descorrerá el velo de su misterio y hará ver en lontananza duengas de grandes tierras. An age will come after many years when the ocean will loose the chain of things and a huge land lie revealed. En que tifos revelará nuevos mundos En que Tule no será ya la última. When Typhus will disclose new worlds, and Tule no more will be the ultimate. Y ahora, escrito y al margen, tal profecía, cumplido la a mi padre el almirante, en el año de 1492. Today I wrote beside it in the margin. This prophecy was fulfilled by my father, the Admiral, in the year 1492. Gracias, Diego Columbus. This is Arthur Hannes at La Rabida. I return you to CBS in London. This is Don Hollenbeck in London. We've made contact again with the Columbus expedition. And now for the story of the landing on the Indies shore this 12th day of October, 1492, we switch you to John Daly. This is John Daly with a shortwave portable transmitter in a ship's boat rowing towards land. We're headed for a fine coral beach. Behind it are trees. Perhaps this is the park of some nobleman's estate. But there are no horses inside yet, no palaces, no rich houses, no people in silks and pearls on the beach, no gold rooftops glistening in the sunrise, but then we're still some way off and so... Oh, I 
can see a man, the first man of the Indies. He's come out of the trees and others are running out after him. Dozens of them, they're speeding down to the water's edge. And many of them, as predicted, are richly dressed in tight-fitting garments of red and blue and... No! Gee, hot of that! They're not dressed at all! What I mistook for clothes is paint. These men are painted every color of the rainbow, but otherwise they haven't got a stitch on. The natural color of their bodies is brown, light brown, a fine, well-built people, and now a boat has touched bottom. Come on, over the side we go. I'm in the water now, up to my knees, but my feet are on land. The ground of the Indies. As we sway the shore, a, a man of the Indies comes rushing forward. He's smiling, holding out his hand. Greetings, my friend. Greetings from Europe. I don't understand, but now Senor Torres, our official interpreter, is talking to him, and he'll have something about it in just a minute. What's the matter, Senor Torres? Senor Torres, can't you understand what this man is saying? No, Senor, I'll ask him what language is in Hebrew and Arabic, but he speaks a strange tongue, a language I never heard before. But Torres, if these are the people of the Indies... Indies, the Indies! These people are barbarians! They do not understand me! Here are the fleet trumpets and drums, and Admiral Columbus is coming ashore. In front of him goes the Royal Standard. Behind him walk the Pinzon brothers, captains from the Pinta and the Nika. The Admiral has taken the Royal Standard and planted it in the sand. He looks across the beach and to the forest beyond, surveying this new strange land. Now he's knelt down, a hush has fallen over the crowd. Even these People here of the Indies stand around in childlike amazement, seem to know something important is happening. Admiral Columbus bent down to kiss the sand. Now he lifts his head to me. Catholicus Majestatis, Nuestro Señor is Don Fernando, and Doña Isabel. Tomo posesión de esta ínsula, y nombro la San Salvador. The Admiral is still kneeling, head bowed in prayer. He's taken possession of this land in the name of their Catholic Majesties, Ferdinand and Isabella, and named it San Salvador. And now the Admiral has risen. He's looking curiously at the natives. No doubt he is wondering, as we are, just who these people are and why they aren't dressed the way we expected to find them, why they don't speak the language that we expected to hear. At any rate, when the official ceremony is over... San Salvador... October 12, 1492, Columbus discovers America. <laughs>